All right, the first case we'll hear this morning is United States versus Howell, and Mr. Sheldon will hear from you. May it please the court. I'm John Sheldon for Mr. Howell. Um, I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please. Um, we're asking this court to reverse the district court's decision denying Mr. Howell's motion to suppress. Um, let me just start by talking about Detective Biha. Detective Biha had an informant, and the informant told him that there was a named target, a specific target, who was going to go to the Aloft Hotel and meet with other drug dealers to distribute those particular drugs. Detective Biha went to the hotel, and the informant's tip was wrong. He couldn't find the target. And this target, again, was a named target. And because he couldn't find the named target, the informant's tip wasn't reliable, and there was no reason why any of the other information should be relevant to anybody else. That is, the target was supposed to be dealing his drugs to other drug dealers. But he's not there, so there's no other people to deal his drugs to. Wait, why? I guess I, I, I certainly agree that the fact that the informant had the name wrong is a problem and not ideal. I, don't, I guess I don't know why that means that the, nothing the informant says is reliable at all. Why, why is that? So first, the informant was wrong about the most important thing. And I, no, let me I agree. Just That's say, not a small thing, but, but right. why does it make everything they say? And it wasn't the name wrong. Nobody argued. Detective Biha testified three times that he was looking for a specific person. There wasn't a confusion of the name. I just want, I don't want to leave here saying, well, maybe he got the name wrong. He didn't get the name wrong. The, the informant specifically, Detective Biha said three times, had a particular target in mind. And in argument, the government said it wasn't Howell. There's you know, no doubt uh, about that. Uh, I think you make a very good point about uh, the informant. The coincidence is uncanny in terms of the vehicle, the license plates, the passenger, uh, and the meeting at the location at the particular motel. Uh, I was trying to figure out how the informant got the driver wrong. And my thinking is maybe we don't know the facts, but maybe he didn't get it wrong. Maybe he did drive up at 2 in the morning. Maybe they did have their meeting at the hotel. And maybe Howell then drove him to the airport uh, and let him go back to Atlanta and, uh, 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 and ha kept the car. And uh, he's returning now. He goes back to his room, picks up a bag. That's a hypothetical, totally speculative. But my point is it doesn't, isn't categorically wrong. What is right is there is something there. And, but even if you set that aside, you have this fellow Howell that all of a sudden appears as a result of that thought about meeting, there was something took place because that bag was in the room and there was drugs in the bag later. We knew that. So uh, 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 the question is, the prob there probably was something going on in that room earlier uh, that in Howell's room. They were put on to Howell, from your point of view, they were put on to Howell by coincidence. Yes, that's right. It wasn't and, uncanny. And so though. now the question is, they're now facing Howell. Yes. And the question now is, what do they know about Howell? And the entire circumstance. That's right. And, and I that's, say, that's really what I think uh, your best case is to try to narrow it to that, exclude yeah. the warrant business because that's of the right. sequencing, and uh, focus on what they knew about Howell at that point and at that location at that time. And uh, uh, there's... That, that's right, Judge. And there are two things that I'd say about that. The first is I wouldn't he knew say... quite it's, a bit about Howell, too. He, he knew a lot about Howell. Yep. And what he knew about Howell... I would say, dispelled reasonable suspicion. The main thing he knew about Howell is he investigated him three to four years ago. And the investigation led to nothing. I always look at this. No, no, that's not fair. They knew he was a distributor. They did not bring charges against him. They didn't have enough against him. He had also been convicted before, right? Judge, I would say that's not fair. Let me retort. Did they that know that? That is not fair. Ten years prior, he had one conviction for possession. Yeah. And then and they investigate him, and he's been told he's the main distributor in the investigation. They knew him as a drug dealer. Your Honor, when, when there is a fact that equally could apply to you or I, I would say that dispels reasonable suspicion. If I am investigated and no charges or arrests, 
It is extremely unfair and unreasonable, I would say, under the exclusionary rule to say that counters on the side of reasonable suspicion because I was investigating. Virtually every case we get, and we get hundreds of them, we have these big conspiracies, and a lot of them are in eastern Virginia. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about huge ones, a lot of drug distribution. There are always people that they can't grab who haven't been pulled in yet, who are told were part of things. Uh, delivery people, people who receive things, people who are, it's, they don't pick up everybody. They pick up who they think they can, they have enough evidence against. They did not have enough evidence apparently against Howell, but they knew of Howell. It's like they, they know the people on the street, they, uh, uh, guys carrying a gun, they know pretty much this guy always carries a gun. They can't arrest him until they have, have better evidence. But uh, I don't think it's fair to say, and there's nothing to suggest the officer's impression about Howell was wrong. They knew of him as a drug dealer, and they knew of the loft as a place where drug dealing took place. And uh, it seems to me uh, that starts getting uh, the officers pretty far along the road, doesn't it? I, I don't think so, Your Honor. And I think it's, it's extremely unfair to have an investigation that was over three years old, probably four. Of course, the detective's testimony is vague on a number of points, I think, intentionally. That doesn't lead to anything. How unfair to the ordinary citizen to be investigated, never arrested, never charged, and then that weighs against him uh, for reasonable suspicion. Uh, there is no information he's had except for a 10-year-old possession conviction and this investigation, which ended in nothing. And now, Forever, Mr. Howell is, is followed around by close to reasonable suspicion because an investigation led to nothing. Um, I would say these facts are not uncanny. Your Honor, when driving down here and thinking about these facts, I thought these facts apply to me when I visit my sister in Boston. No, Almost no, all no, these no, facts. No. You're a lawyer, and yes. you go to the Loft Hotel. Uh, yes, I do. And we, there's no suspicion that you... There was a proposed meeting through a reliable informant at that hotel. And that proposed meeting of several drug dealers was told about. We don't know whether that occurred, but Howell is at that motel at that time. And they know Howell's a drug dealer. Now, you can discount the informant, but they've been using him for, what, five years? And well, Your Honor, to say Mr. Howell's a drug dealer when his conviction is 10 years old and a three and a half year investigation leads to nothing. I think it's very unfair to say Mr. Howell's a drug dealer. Well, it's, inc In, it's, it's incredibly bad luck, isn't it, that a person who's known to the police to have had some drug problems in the past shows up and meets every single, checks every single box that the informant said except the name. Your Honor, I think you're making the same mistake the district court did. It is overwhelmingly clear that it was a coincidence. It is overwhelmingly clear that the informant, when describing the target, had a specific person in mind. And 100% of the evidence says this was a named person. They didn't name him for obvious reasons at the evidence you're hearing. It's a named person. The detective Bihar never suggested that it may have been Howell that was being described. The government never suggested. The government literally said during argument, JA 140 to 141, the government said it was not Howell. It was a coincidence. And what I was trying to say to uh, Judge Niemeyer is, is when I go to Boston, I stay at a hotel, I rent a car, it's out of state plates, sometimes it's black. How uncanny is it? Not very. And when facts in a case, all the, the facts, the rental car, the being with a woman, those apply to almost everybody at a hotel, the one night or two night stay. What is extremely... What about, what about the meeting of drug dealers that was going to take place at that hotel? Not confirmed. This court has said that no, for a tip to be reliable. That's informant related. That's right. And this court has said... So we, we have to assume that there was somebody else uh, other than the identified in, uh, person in the vehicle that was going to be at that meeting because it was uh, it used it in the plural, a meeting of drug dealers. That's right. This court has said for a tip to be relied on, it has to be reliable. It has to be confirmed in some, in some way. The extent that Detective Bihar tried to confirm the tip it was not confirmed. That is, the target wasn't there. Of course, it's possible that the target was there and left. However, to the extent he tried to confirm it, he couldn't confirm it, but he found Howell's name. It is a catch-22 to say he found a drug dealer. In fact, of everything we know about Mr. Howell, 
weighs against reasonable suspicion, including this very important fact that Mr. Howe wrote his own name in the guest book. He signed in under his own name. Remember the informant said, or the detective Biha testified, that he was very aware that uh, drug dealers don't use their own name when they rent cars or they um, log in at a hotel. And, and Howell did. The, the few facts that match, Does one- Does the uh, record show who rented the car? No, there's nothing about who rented the car, right? And what I say in my brief is, look, when you drive a car, I'm often driving uh, my wife's car or somebody else's car. The license plate, running the registration doesn't tell you who's driving the car. Well, I understand, Same with the rent. but the rental agreement would show who signed off on it. That's right, and there was no evidence about that. And I, I'll save the remainder of my time for yeah. about it. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sheldon. Uh, Ms. Cheney? Ms. Cheney, excuse me. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Assistant United States Attorney Amanda Cheney. This court should affirm the denial of the defendant's motion to suppress for two primary reasons. The first is that the totality of cir circumstances surrounding this traffic stop do establish reasonable suspicion of narcotics trafficking. The other is the existence of the outstanding warrant for the defendant's arrest, which independently provides sufficient uh, basis for the traffic stop. Because this is a case where the totality- Can I that around? Do you agree that we could uphold the search without reaching the arrest warrant issue? Yes, Your Honor. Because I, I guess I will, I will confess some trepidation about the arrest warrant issue. So you think that we could just ignore the arrest warrant entirely and uphold without relying on that? I think it's an independently sufficient basis. So I then think you think that both of them are independently sufficient basis? Yes, The warrant Your Honor. is sufficient and the non-warrant stuff is sufficient? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, because this is a case where the totality well, the of... sequencing, I think uh, uh, Judge Hyten's uh, question points to a slippery slope because it seems to me the sequencing of the information about the warrant uh, gets you into trouble as you go along. I mean, if the traffic stop was not justified by a traffic violation, the traffic stop was justified by suspicion of, uh, of uh, drug trafficking. And so as soon as the police officer and the detectives learned that this was non-extraditable, uh, it seems to me they should have let him go uh, all if you rely just on the warrant. In other words, all of a sudden they check the warrant out, and uh, before, even before the uh, uh, dog sniff, uh, they learn that it's non-extraditable. At that point, they say, we're sorry, the warrant we stopped you on uh, is non-extraditable, and you're free to go on your way. Isn't that what would have to happen? Your Honor, the warrant itself is sufficient basis for the traffic stop. It is, but then they learn shortly after the traffic stop and before any other evidence uh, of drug uh, uh, um, sniffing or anything else, they learn that the warrant is not a justification, right? No, Your Honor. I would point, Your Honor, to uh, the joint appendix on page... No, just answer my question. So Didn't they learn that it was non-extraditable? No, Your Honor. After uh, after the dog alerted to the vehicle, they learned that the that dog was not That was a confirmation, wasn't it? Didn't they first learn? They first knew, Your Honor, that there was an outstanding warrant. They did not um, investigate further until the stop occurred, because at that point there was either contact so or temporary detention. So you're detention. suggesting the record says that they did not learn that the warrant was non-extraditable until after the dog alerted? Correct, Your Honor. And that is at Joint Appendix, uh, page 114. I, I had thought that they learned right before. No, Your Honor. In the morning, so the... Didn't they run it on a dispatch? Didn't the police officer run it on his own dispatch system? The officer that stopped Mr. Howell did run it on his dispatch system and after he, he was stopped. He learned that it wasn't extraditable. The detectives in the morning that arrived in the morning around 7 o'clock, they were the ones who initially found the arrest warrant I himself. understand, but let, I stick with my sequence. The police officer stops it. He runs the warrant through his system, right? And he learns it's non-extraditable, right? Only after the stop, Your Honor. Right. After the stop, he learns it's non-extraditable. Is that before or after the dog shows up? After. At approximately 1221 to 1222, the dispatcher responds to Officer Bird that the warrant check uh, resulted in it, the warrant not being extraditable. The... Uh, K-9 alerts at 1216 to 1217 p.m. That's at Joint Appendix So he learned no information before that? That officer, no. The detective knew that there was an outstanding warrant 
and that was at approximately 10 o'clock. That was an NCIC check. Well, I understand that. I understand the fact that there was a policy not until you well, get in contact. Can I ask you about that policy? Where in the record is that policy that says you can't confirm an NCIC check? The record, uh, I don't I have these. I wasn't able to find anywhere in the record where, it actually, where there's policy supposedly exists. It, um, I don't have the joint appendix page. It was attached. Yeah, um, it was an exhibit at the motion to suppress hearing. Okay. Um, the policy itself. Also, the screenshot of the active arrest warrant from Detective Beha. That's at uh, Joint Appendix page 45. It's probably somewhere near. I just don't have the exact citation. Sure. Can I take you back to the, the reasonable suspicion issue, which we could just decide this case based on? Well, what, what do you say to your friend on the other side's response? I mean, we've talked about the name being wrong, but what about the fact that the informant said the car would be from a northern state and Last I checked, Georgia is not a northern state. That's correct, Your Honor. And I want to get to first the name itself because we're talking here about the tip sure. and the reliability of the tip. When uh, my colleague says that uh, because the name given was not the name of the defendant, um, therefore the analysis should stop and this tip is not reliable, it's not um, completely fair. It doesn't look at all of the information that we have here. First, um, the government's not conceding that the informant necessarily got the target's identity wrong. Uh, perhaps the name, but not the identity. There's nothing in the record that shows that this target, because he wasn't in the hotel's registry, was not at that hotel that day. And there's nothing, um, Your Honor, to uh, show that the uh, just because the name wasn't in the registry that the target wasn't using some sort of pseudonym or that he didn't check into the hotel under another name, or that the name that the target had, or excuse me, that the informant had for the target was uh, a not, uh, was a name, a, a name that Xavier Howe also went by, it was an alias for Xavier Howe. So to say that um, because the name itself uh, is not on the registry means that the person wasn't there and the whole tip is reliable is, is not a, a sound um, basis uh, that this court should rely upon. Um, we're, when we get to um, the other factors of the tip, specifically, as the court pointed out, the timing and the specificity of this tip. This particular morning, the people involved in this drug deal were supposed to have, uh, supposed to be leaving the hotel. This particular hotel in well, Chesapeake. We don't know. The meeting uh, could have well have taken at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there's no suggestion that the meeting didn't occur. Correct. The informant mentions that the uh, people involved will be uh, spending the night at the hotel, and that's why the um, investigators get there the next morning, early the next morning, that they would be leaving that particular morning. Um, this particular hotel, which a Detective Beha uh, testified about making numerous drug <laughs> arrests and drug seizures from, he spoke to drug traffickers who stated that this was a preferred location, this was a preferred hotel in the area for this sort of narcotics trafficking activity. And then when we check, uh, the detectives check the hotel registry, Mr. Howe's name is found, along with uh, another um, individual who had involvement in drug distribution that the detectives say, and whose name they recognize. But we, we can't then ignore what happens after what, what the investigators know about Mr. Howe. It's the tip um, combined with their knowledge of Mr. Howe's history, which the court um, uh, is well aware of. There's a 2008 conviction, not for simply possession, but for possession with intent to distribute a controlled substance. After that, prior conviction, he's listed as a director in the business with, uh, uh, whereby um, controlled substances are being purchased. That's about 2014, 2015. After that, a year or two after, CIs are naming, name him as a, uh, someone involved in drug trafficking. Um, and one specifically says they've seen him with, uh, in possession of drugs. And then current day, back um, when this uh, stop occurred, he's got an outstanding arrest warrant. This is the information that the de uh, detectives had um, on that morning when they're encountering Mr. Howell. Not simply a tip, not simply a name, and that's it. This tip, with the information, the timing and specificity of that tip, as well as their knowledge of Mr. Howe's history, let alone the fact, which the court has already pointed to, their uncanny similarities to the tip and Mr. Howe, how he appears that day, the color and the type of vehicle, the dark-colored SUV, it being a rental car, short stay, 
not only that the short stay was um, one night, it, it was the night that uh, about which the informant gave the information about narcotics trafficking. Um, he's accompanied by an unknown African-American female. That matched this tip. The officers didn't know, I, um, my colleague mentioned in his brief that, you know, the officers knew he had a sister. They didn't know the identity of this woman at the time that uh, this stop occurred. And uh, add to that the cautious driving after the fact. Now, innocent factors, the court well knows, can create, um, can come together to create reasonable suspicion. That's in Neverett. Um, it's not that any of these factors alone um, are suspicious, and, and that's outside of the tip, of course, but are suspicious in and of themselves. It's that um, they're all taking place on, this, on the night in question, the night about which there is this tip from a reliable informant that there will be a meeting of drug traffickers, and then that combined with <coughs> Mr. Howell's history of involvement. When um, counsel gives a description of, you know, this describes a number of innocent people, we look to um, the court's thinking in um, Proust, and we start with a uh, basically a, a number of innocent actors, right? The number of people at the hotel um, this particular day. That's a big pool of people. Um, and, and, and that could in implicate everyone um, as to this tip. However, every other piece of information from this tip shrinks the pool, um, shrinks the pool, and it becomes more, more narrow. People driving rental cars. People driving rental cars with out-of-state tags. People driving a rental car that's dark in color. People with a female companion who's leaving that morning. Um, and then by the time we get to the cautious driving, um, we have narrowed the pool so much. We have shrunk, shrunk the pool so much. Can that I ask you a question about the cautious driving? And I tried to figure this out in the record. Is your understanding that the officers who were tailing him, who observed this cautious driving, were they in a marked or an unmarked car? Unmarked, Your Honor. The re you imagine that maybe the reason I'd say that is like, I think a, a fact that we can observe about the world is that when people observe marked police cars, they often start driving very cautiously. Absolutely. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, but your idea is here, this person wouldn't necessarily have known they were being observed by the police at the time? Correct. And at this point, um, we are so, um, we have so much reasonable suspicion that this is the latest um, addition to that. If we were to take... Um, Basically, by the time we reach the cautious driving, there's so much other um, uh, indicators. There's so many other factors pointing to towards this vehicle and the people in it being involved in narcotics trafficking, um, and that these uh, this specific this specific vehicle itself and the person in it, Mr. Howe, is the um, one to investigate. Um, so such that the fact that there are other innocent actors or other innocent travelers. Um, is not as significant here as the fact that all this reasonable suspicion has now been piled on. Um, Let me the, just say that you've got, you've got a lot of a lot of, uh, of of suspicious activity here. But once you reach the point where you're driving, if you speed, you're going to get stopped, and if you're cautiously driving, you're going to get stopped. I'm not big on the cautious driving being a factor, but the, but you've got a lot of other stuff to work with there. Understood, Your Honor. Um, Can I ask you? Uh, did the detectives learn about the warrant before the police officer did? That no. was non-extraditable? No. The Who de learned first, the police officer Bird? Yes, sir. So he did his check when he made the stop. Yes, sir. Ten minutes later, he got response, it's non-extraditable. After he sent his response, I think, at uh, uh, yes. 1211 exactly. to 1221. Yes, Your Honor. The detectives... When did they learn? Um, I believe the detectives were in communication with Officer Bird. So Bird advised them? Yes, Your Honor. And the, uh, and the dog alerted uh, uh, five minutes before he heard back? Yes, Your Honor. So your argument is that when the dog alerted, they had probable cause at that point? Yes, Your Honor. And that, that stop wasn't unnecessarily prolonged. It was five minutes. Um, they were being stopped for... Um, either you could say the reasonable suspicion that led to the traffic stop, or you could say the fact of the warrant itself to investigate that. And that's um, a temporary stop um, to perform an investigative function. There was no um, unduly, there was no, um, I guess, no undue stop. They, uh, they did exactly what one would expect them to do. They, they stopped the vehicle. They checked the information. It didn't take long to come back. By that time, the dog had alerted. It, 
if, as the as our brief what, says. Sorry, do you have a sense of what percentage of out of state warrants are non extraditable? I, 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 that's a genuine question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't either, Your Honor. Um, I think uh, because of just Detective De, uh, Beha's testimony during the motion to suppress, that it is um, frequent enough that it's not extraditable that they have to check every time. Um, such you that, you know, that's what the, the warrant is extraditable. Correct. He, he mentioned that um, he had seen it go both ways. You stop somebody, the warrant says it's extraditable, and it's not when they actually call and confirm, and then um, the, the opposite way, Your Honor, that, that it turns would out you, that it is. Would you agree that in general it seems likely, though, that the more minor the offense, the more likely it is to be non-extraditable? Like, I imagine a homicide warrant is almost always going to be extraditable. I suspect a failure to appear warrant is on balance, less likely to be extraditable? I, I can't say. I guess it would depend on what the underlying um, offense would be for which the person was well, that's what failed I'm saying. to appear. If the underlying offense is trivial on balance, it's more likely to be non-extraditable? I think so, Your Honor, but I don't think the officers in this case had access to that information. And, and I guess to make, to make express something that I think is implicit, if the officer knew a warrant was extraditable, non-extraditable, if a police officer knew that a given warrant was non-extraditable, is it implicit in what we're saying that that would not supply probable cause to stop somebody? If you knew there was a warrant and you knew the warrant was non-extraditable. So, of course, those aren't the facts here. No, of course. Um, I think that the policy in this case exists, and it's a national policy, because um, it's just a record check. Um, and the, 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 the hypothetical bit about is when the officer stops the vehicle and he knows the warrant can't be extraditable, is not extraditable, is there but can, he use, can he use the warrant to stop the vehicle? I don't think so, but the, the reason that the policy exists is because that what's written in NCIC is not always accurate or up to date. Oh, I understand. In other words, uh, the warrant could be for murder. Or the warrant could be for not fail, for failing to appear uh, at a deposition. I mean, we're talking about a big range of things. But my point is, uh, it's really just a follow-up on Judge Hyten's question. I would assume you have to concede that if the officer knew the warrant was non-extraditable, that would not form a basis for stopping the vehicle. I still think a brief investigatory stop is possible in those circumstances. To do what? to verify the information from NCIC, let's say. If we're in a world where wow. we know... Oh, he knows. He's already checked before. Uh, with the hypothetical is the officer knows. He's done the check. The warrant is no good. And not, it's, not, it's good, but it's, it's non-extraditable. And, that, and he limited, stops. Uh, that limited set of facts, I think that's correct. You cannot stop. All right. And can I go back? There's no dispute that in this case, the officer knew this was a failure to appear warrant, right? That was in the original... That before anything was confirmed, the initial hit told this officer this was a failure to appear warrant. They knew it wasn't a homicide warrant. They knew it was a failure to appear warrant. They knew that this defendant was based in Georgia and that this occurred in Virginia. That what occurred in Virginia? The stop itself. The stop so itself occurred. coming into contact with Mr. Howell were... was in a different state, and then they see a failure to okay. appear. Okay, they knew the failure. Well, just one follow-up on that. They knew the failure to appear warrant was for a Georgia offense. They knew that. Yes, I believe that's in the screenshot, the, the actual, um, where it comes from. Would it make a difference if the failure to appear was the failure to appear for a felony trial as opposed to the failure to appear for a traffic violation? I, I don't think so. If we're in the world that um, Your Honor's created where we know it's extraditable from the second we check someone's record, um, if it's extraditable, um, then it doesn't matter that it's for failure to appear to a traffic hearing. Well, I don't know this, uh, the answer to this, but I'm, I'm wondering if he fails to appear for a felony trial in Georgia and they issue a warrant for his arrest or, uh, or uh, make it even more serious. He's, he's being convicted. He's being tried for... Uh, murder, and uh, he's on bail, and he flies a coop and they issue a warrant. Uh, would that be extraditable, that warrant? I think so, Your Honor. But again, I think this case points to whether so or not the well, stop itself can I'm just trying to get some 
ground rules here. Yes, so when they see it's failure to appear, a failure to appear warrant could be extraditable or could be non-extraditable. Correct. That's your point. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, I just one last question about the policy. So as I understand it, uh, in the record, we have the detective's testimony that he was prohibited from confirming the warrant status. Is there as the actual policy in the record anywhere? Yes. Um, and I believe uh, Your Honor asked me that earlier. Right. I I've, have... I've, I've asked my staff to look and they were not <laughs> find it. <laughs> um, I apologize, Your Honor. The, as I said, the policy was attached as an exhibit at the motion to su uh, suppress hearing. Um, the only site I have, I don't, um, I know Is that it was included. the right page? 47, Your Honor. 47. Okay. Yes, this is Chesapeake's policy. It, it, is it the actual policy or is it the testimony from the officer? Uh, it's the actual policy, okay, 46. And the, the NCIC policy that's referenced, I, I don't see it um, attached here. Understood. Um, with that, um, Your Honor, uh, Your Honors, um, I, I think that y when we point to the tip in this case, and, and, and Your Honors, and Your Honors mentioned it um, already, but um, it, it's not a coincidence. It's it, it's an uncanny coincidence. Um, it, it's too uncanny it to it's be not, a coincidence. It's got a couple of um, uh, material material uh, <laughs> flaws in it, and the question is whether it is an accurate tip based on what he learned and something in the intervening changed the facts like somebody else was driving changed or it's just a misinformation it's a wrong uh, it, it's a wrong incident altogether uh, it's hard to tell because uh, uh, number one we we don't have the name of the person uh, and number two uh, there was also suggestion that the vehicle was coming from the north and uh, uh, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, there, it seems to me that there are hypotheticals that could still make that accurate. I mean, it's a, uh, I would guess that if they had a meeting or if it was, that was accurate, the meeting was probably at the night in the motel room. Uh, 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 drug dealing is often uh, 2.33 in the morning. It's a, uh, uh, and this was a meeting of, of drug dealers, which uh, was a thought to be a forecast, but... All right, your time. I, we've let you go a little bit beyond. Let, let me hear, let us hear from Mr. Sheldon. And before you get started, Mr. Sheldon, could I just confirm uh, what your understanding of the timing and the sequence is? I probably yes, had a misunderstanding, but as I understand what I'm hearing now from the government is that Officer Byrd stopped the vehicle at uh, uh, a few minutes after 12. Uh, at 12.11, Officer Byrd requested uh, a check through the uh, system of the warrant. At 12.16, five minutes later, the dog alerted. At 12.21, the officer learned that the warrant was non-extraditable. Is that correct? That is partially correct, Your Honor, and I think I can answer both questions about the policy, the percentage of non-extraditable with this answer. At JA 117, Officer Byrd testified that he got the warrant and he testified, and this goes to the percentage. What percentage? I would say zero are extraditable because Officer Could Byrd testified. Could you just answer my timing question and then You're we correct. can make judgments about that? You're correct. Okay. Except that so Officer Byrd. I want a follow-up question then. Yeah. If I'm correct on that and the Officer Byrd <laughs> is making a stop based on a warrant and at that time he doesn't know whether it's extraditable or not then it seems to me uh, the problem you are facing is that the dog alerts before he learns the warrant is not reason to stop. He makes a stop probably justifiable on a warrant which he doesn't know whether it's extraditable or not. The dog alerts, and at that point he has probable cause, doesn't he? I disagree, Your Honor. J117. Let me Officer ask Bird. you, no, my question was, if the dog alerts, does he have probable cause? Yes. Okay. That's right. Once, if the dog alerts is probable cause, we're, okay. we, we're not arguing about okay. that. What we're arguing is that Byrd testified that he had zero in his entire career extraditable warrants. He looks at the warrant. It's a, it's a failure to be here, out-of-state warrant, and he has testified, I have never had one that's extraditable. Zero. 
why they check? We know why they checked. Yeah, the whole, the, Your Honor, the whole reason why the whole ruse was done. Why didn't, the big the, question the is. The police case. officer Bird is told by the officers there's a warrant, outstanding warrant for this guy, and we want you to stop him. And it seems to me that off, that entitles the officer to stop him unless there's something defective about the warrant. Judge Niemeyer, I think the one thing that's obvious about this case is the entire thing was a ruse, and the only question is, is the ruse So supportable? Officer Bird knows it's a ruse? Yes, of course he does. Why? De he's, he's because Detective Biha has Howell in front of him with the bag and the car and the lady. And Detective Biha has all the resources in the world to arrest Howell right then. Why doesn't he? He knows everything. He's been looking at the warrant for two hours. Why doesn't he take him right then? Why would he risk letting him drive away? Because he knows in the officer's situation, well, in his position, he knows it's not enough. I'm talking about Officer Bird. He was a police officer, wasn't he? Yes. A uniformed Bird. police officer. That's right. All right. He's called and he says, pick him up. We have a warrant for his arrest. And he knows why. He's informed. He knows why. Where, where's that in the record? Uh, he's, the, the testimony from Biha is that I had four or five conversations with Beard about Howell and that I wanted him to pull him out, to track him and pull him over. What did he say? Tell me what he said that made the officer doubt that this was anything but legit. Your Honor, if this wasn't a ruse, then why didn't Detective B.I. just arrest him? Look, I'm not asking for the logic. I'm asking for the evidence. The evidence is that when Detective Beard found no traffic violations, he eventually pulled him over. He didn't ask for it. He was called to say arrest him because of a warrant. He didn't ask him to pick. He said stop him. Because we have probable cause to believe, we have an outstanding warrant, and we have a, a... And as soon as Detective, as soon as Officer Bird saw the warrant, he knew, this is from the officer's perspective, we have to look at it, he knew that he had never had an extraditable warrant in this situation before. Zero. At that point, it is unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment to continue Wait, to detain. I, I, I was just make sure. So I'm looking at page 117. Yeah. What I see him saying is, I've never seen a non-extraditable warrant. He actually says basically two things. He said, I've never seen a non-extraditable warrant. I've actually never done a full extraditable warrant, but I've seen situations where I've stopped someone who showed a warrant and they'd already been served in the warrant. I mean, he actually, in back-to-back -back sentences, seems to say things that directly contradict each other. And so the district court was not clearly erroneous when the district court said that he had no faith and he was skeptical of the officer's I, testimony. In wait, note wait, six... The, sorry, the district court... District court said the district court had no faith and was skeptical, or the officer the, had no faith. The district court said he was skeptical of the testimony in the warrant uh, regarding the warrant and put no faith in that. In note you, six, may I ask why does that matter under Wren? Because the district court heard the evidence, made factual what's in findings. The heart. I mean, Wren says. I mean, whether that makes sense or not, Wren says very clearly that what's in this officer's heart does not matter. Not not what's in his heart, but the district court was skeptical of the testimony of police officers and found that it was a the whole um, warrant issue was a ruse in note six. That's just too. And those general. were findings. That's just too general. Uh, if you focus at Judge uh, uh, Officer Bird, he's a police officer and he makes the traffic stops. These detectives don't want to make traffic stops. They don't want to take him down like they do uh, uh, drug dealers. They wanted the officer to stop to, to uh, determine what's in the bag. And so he tells him, we have a warrant, stop him. Detective and he Bihar. stopped him, and uh, uh, I'm a little surprised at what Judge Heitens just pointed out to you, that the officer said, I've never seen a nun. Although I think, in, in fairness, when I was, I kept reading, I realized the court clears that up next question later. and says yeah. he's never seen an extra line. That's right, and the, uh, that's right, and and the district court made factual findings and didn't rely on the warrant because he was skeptical because they had all the ability in the world to confirm it and didn't. Of course, Detective Bihad never found this warrant in any other database. Right? He looked in other databases, only found it in one. It was a it it was a failure. But see, that's from irrelevant. Georgia. What's what's relevant is the stop and the dog search. The stop. The question is whether the automobile stop was legitimate. If it was, we have a dog sniff that creates probable. Well, if so you're going the, to, it seems to me that we ought to be focusing on Bird. If you're focusing on Bird, he has never had an extraditable warrant. As soon as he sees it, he doesn't have reasonable. And the district court was not clearly erroneous in Note Six when the district court was skeptical of the whole mess of testimony about the warrant, which is why I think we didn't discuss it when I was arguing. 
Um, you know, the problem with the exclusionary rule is this, if I can just, uh, do I have? Do no, I, you're over time, but go ahead. And, oh, you got the problem seconds. is this, right? That you only get the cases where they're arrested. If Howell had no drugs, he wouldn't be a drug dealer. This would be a coincidence, and that's the problem with the exclusionary rule. You know, it was so clear when Biha said, to be clear, the out-of-state target was not the defendant. He, he's not talking about confusion about names. The testimony and the argument of the government in the district court was there was no confusion. It's not how. Thank you so much for okay, letting me Okay, thank post. you. Uh, we'll come down and uh, greet counsel and then proceed on to the next case. Ready, we'll hear from you. May it please the court. James Thorson, counsel for Eddie Tweet, the plaintiff appellant in this matter. And we're here today to address the dispositive issue before the court, and that is, did the district court err when it ruled on the 12B6 and 12C pleadings in this case that there uh, was qualified immunity for the defendants, finding that the defendants uh, produced uh, probable cause for the arrest of Tweet and that uh, the defendants uh, were not the causation of it because the causation was broken by the issuance of the warrant by an independent Can I ask you to magistrate. respond perhaps more fully than you did in your reply brief to something that was in the response brief that I thought was kind of telling? Um, so the response brief points out that in your request for oral argument, you state this appeal concerns important legal questions that are not yet decided. How is that not a concession that the defendants are entitled to qualified immunity under prong two? Your Honor, uh, it's not a concession at all. It's but important legal questions that are undecided is pretty close to saying it doesn't violate clearly established law as declared by this court or the Supreme Court. Well, the, the defendants in this case want the court to say uh, you have to find for uh, uh, the matter to be clearly established, you have to find that the exact cir circumstances uh, dictate. No, I agree. You don't have to find the exact circumstances, but the language of the Supreme Court has said that existing law, but it also says, so the reason I ask this is that in your reply brief, you just say sort of the right not to have your First Amendment violated is clearly established, or your right not to have the Fourth Amendment violated is clearly established. And the Supreme Court has said over and over and over again, that is not how qualified immunity works. It has to be, I agree, the standard is not whether there's a case directly on point. Everybody agrees that's not the standard. But what the Supreme Court has said is existing authority has to put the issue beyond dispute so that any reasonable officer would know. And I don't know how, if this appeal concerns important legal questions that are not yet decided, how that standard can be satisfied. Well, Your Honor, um to the extent that the law is uh, argued uh, and set out in our brief, we, th we think that the, uh, the question is for this particular plaintiff who is a school bus driver confronting a disruptive student on a school bus, uh, that, that question has not been precisely decided. Well, I guess, let, let me put it this way then, maybe. What decision of the U.S. Supreme Court, of this court, of the Supreme Court of Virginia, or a robust consensus of persuasive authority do you think is most directly analogous to this situation? 
Well, the Supreme Court, uh, United States Supreme Court case judge in the New Jersey uh, versus uh, uh, Teo case uh, had to do with uh, students and uh, school teachers. Uh, that's, that's Remind me what the facts of that case were. That's not a fake question. I'm actually genuinely asking you to remind me what the facts of that case Yes, Judge. Just a moment. <laughs> Judge, we we clear uh, we set out uh, in our brief the uh, precedent for uh, courts finding uh, understood regarding matters of schools and. Uh, Can I ask you that maybe a different question that I also had from this was based on your brief. You argue this is page twenty of your brief. You say that the video of the incident failed to show, you said your client's name is pronounced Tweet, is that correct? Tweet, yes. Tweet. You say the video failed to show Tweet's mens rea was to cause public inconvenience or annoyance or alarm. And I guess, could you just elaborate a little more? How could a video show or not show mens rea? Well, by her, her. I understand how it could show actus reus, but I'm not, right. it was not immediately obvious to me how a video could show or disprove mens rea. Well, uh, you could argue the video can't read a, uh, a person's mind, but you can tell from the uh, actions and the words what, what the, the intent is. And I think that's the argument. But if you look at the video, it, it's, it doesn't show Mrs. Uh, Tweet or Addie Tweet uh, disorderly conduct uh, violating the statute of Virginia. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, I did look at the video several times. Good. Yes. And uh, uh, I did see her leaning over into the seat, pressing her head toward the student and saying, bring it on. Uh, and uh, of course, up to that point, the student had never spoken to the uh, bus driver. The student was speaking to a friend and said, I'm going to hit her straight in the face when he, she's getting on the bus. Yeah. And uh, uh, she gets on the bus and uh, the bus driver gets up and says, are you talking about me? You talking about me? And the student never answered. And then the bus driver leans over into the seat and says, bring it on. This, uh, this, and this, tell me what you think bring it on means. Answer my question. No, I asked you a question. Right. What, what, bring that's it what, on. What does that mean? That's what Tweet is saying. It says, I'm asking you what you think that means. If right. you don't have a, an opinion, you can say so. I do have an opinion, Judge. And I'm looking at the, the video uh, transcribed here just first off when the student is walking onto the bus could you answer my question yeah just what what does the term bring it on generally mean it means hit me doesn't it i don't think i don't think that in this context it necessarily means hit me no well, she, uh, the answer the bus me, driver heard the student say getting on the bus i'm going to hit her I'm a, and the student is speaking to a fellow student, I'm going to hit her directly in the face. And so that's the, the, she never says that to the bus driver. The bus driver interprets that statement, her being uh, uh, the bus driver is the object. So the bus driver comes over, leans over the seat and says, bring it on. Now tell me what you think bring it on means. The Answer, bring it on means answer my question in this context because she says she's asking the student. You don't think bring it on means take your first shot? You're going to hit me directly in the face? Take your first shot. You don't think that's what that means? Judge, it could mean that. There could be a, a broad spectrum of, of things. But I don't think that the bring it on statement by a tweet to the student was to say let's get in a fight. And the student. No, I don't know. I, I would think that's the invitation for a fight myself. That's uh, my well reading of it. And I saw her actions. She's leaning right over into that bus chair. And, uh, and the student is basically refusing to answer. And then the teacher says, I'm going to call 911. And of course, the student says, I want to. Well, right off after the bus. Uh, my recording, uh, my uh, understanding of the video was that after she says, bring it on, uh, you're going to hit me in the face. 
and the student says at uh, 28, 28, excuse me, 28, 29 seconds into the video, yes, ma'am, that's you. She admitted, she ultimately admitted that when she got on the bus, when she was getting on the bus, that's what she was intending to get the message across to tweet. She was speaking loud enough to, so that tweet would understand that she wanted to hit, uh, be hit, uh, she wanted to hit tweet in the face, straight well, in the face. Different difficulty strikes me that your client has here. So we have a warrant in this case, which normally would break any causal chain. Um, does the complaint make any allegation of Rhodes telling Jones to say any particular thing to the magistrate judge? Is there any, I, when I looked at the complaint, I didn't see any allegation. Like, so, I mean, once there's a warrant, you know, you basically have to show there's something wrong with the process of getting the warrant. And obviously, if someone told someone to lie to a magistrate judge, that would be a bad thing. But does your complaint actually say, you know, Rhodes told Jones to say X to the magistrate judge? Is there anything in the complaint about that? Well, I think you can refer it. Pa paragraph uh, 29 says, Officer Jones, at the direction of Rhodes, instituted the criminal proceedings. And you look at the letter. Well, at the direction, sure. But at the direction of is go get a warrant, right? Yeah. Not, not telling me what I should say to the magistrate. Judge. Well, uh, if you look at the letter of May 10th that uh, Rhodes gave tweet, on uh, Joint Appendix page 15, uh, the letter says, I told you that this would not change the fact that Officer Jones was going to press charges against you for disorderly conduct. Now, how does Rhodes know that uh, the day before it happens? The it's officer in the told them. I mean, there seems like a, a number of ways that they could know I that. thought they looked at the film. Tape. We don't know that Jones looked at the tape. There's well, no evidence. I have no evidence of that. Well, the question is, if you have no evidence of that, how do you know that the magistrate judge didn't have probable cause? The only argument you could make is a Frank's argument, or you could make an argument that the, uh, there was, uh, the evidence presented to the magistrate was insufficient, but you have neither. We, we've made those arguments, Judge. The evidence is Where's insufficient. Where's the evidence of that? There's no evidence that Jones had any viewing of the tape. It seems like it's based on Rhodes telling Jones, go get a warrant against Sweet for so what, disorderly what, what conduct. You, what, what do you say Jones told the magistrate judge? Well, we don't know. Have well, no idea. It's unrecorded. There's well, no, there's, the magistrate judge issued, exercised uh, uh, judicial discretion to issue a warrant. On false information, misleading information. Well, that's my point. Why is it false? Because what, if, you, if you look at the video, uh, there's... There's no disorderly conduct by tweet. And also, if you look at the warrant, Your Honor, there's no listing well, of... Well, what's the definition of mis uh, uh, conduct? I thought uh, offer to do violence is um, disorderly conduct. If you, it has... What's a, the statutory language? If it has a direct tendency to cause violence, that's part of the statute. And also, Judge, Virginia Code Section 22.1-279.1A gives tweet who's a bus driver, a school employee, uh, do uh, deference to her actions to protect herself, to protect others. And that is a big elephant in this room. The defense never even responded to that in the, in the uh, uh, opening brief of the uh, plaintiff. So th if the court looks at 22.1-279. Well, you brought an action against two people for malicious prosecution. Right. And the prosecution was authorized by a judicial officer, right? Ultimately. What do you mean ultimately? Yes. Actually. By, by a warrant, yes. yes. But it All was right. instigated, it so, was caused by, the, by Rhodes and the officer. But so, that, but that's the way it always happens. People go down to the, to the magistrate, the magistrate either issues a warrant or doesn't issue a warrant, and that's probable cause. Then after that, it may go to trial. And the person may be acquitted, but it doesn't remove the problem. Of, of course, I understand that, Your Honor, totally. But in this case, where is the probable cause? There's no probable cause. Uh, looking at that video, well, how, how can, do we know? You don't know what the officer was told, do you? No, and at the, at the pleading stage, how, how can we? We haven't done any discovery. Well, how do you have a cause of action if you don't? Because I mean, it, it, there's got to be. Uh, because we know that the girl caught on the I, bus. I can tell you that the video would justify uh, uh, a claim that the statute was violated, I think. 
I, in my judgment, looking at the video, it looks to me like the bus driver offered to get into a fight with the student. Bring it on, hit me, basically. Uh, let's get this over with. Well, this, but she didn't, Judge. And she, she uh, said, I'm going to call somebody to get you off the bus. Well, the girl gets up and says, F you, I'm, I'm leaving the bus, and, and F you, bitch, to, uh, to everybody when she leaves. And the girl got on the bus with the intent to, to cause the disruption. It wasn't Tweet as the bus driver. It was the student caused the, the disruption. The student didn't even talk to the bus driver. The student got the on student the bus. The student was talking to the bus driver when she got on by I saying, I'm going to hit you in the face. That's what the no, student the was student talking. the student was talking to another student and said, I'm going to hit her. Her. Okay. It, that's, and that they're talking to the student, and the student gets on and sits down. If and I the bus said, driver gets up and said, you talking about me? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the bus driver wasn't naive. The bus driver understood the student was cloaking her talk about, I'm going to hit you straight in the face with her friends. How, did, how could she not uh, understand that Tweet would hear that? It'd be like me saying something to defense counsel over here about the court, and I'm, I could say, well, I'm not talking to the court. I'm talking about the court. Judge, <coughs> it, it's, it's clear that this was a disorderly conduct on the student, not tweet. And again, the Virginia Code section 22.1-279.1A gives tweet the deference to, to control disruptive students and control students that would cause threats or harm to other students or to herself. And that's what she did. And that's uh, this warrant should never have been issued for uh, disorderly conduct. It's it's highly, highly uh, unusual that this happened. And I'm seeing I'm over my time, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thorson. Uh, Mr. Sparks. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Randy Sparks from Kaufman and Canoles on behalf of Officer Jones in this case. Your Honors, we're, we're here, and I think that uh, in your questioning of, uh, with Mr. Thorson, you've hit the very main issues. I won't belabor these points, but I think the short answer in all of this is that the district court did exactly what it was supposed to do in these circumstances. Faced with a qualified immunity argument, it took that issue up at the earliest time it could so that the, uh, the government officials wouldn't have to go through the trial. Uh, he reviewed the video that was referenced repeatedly throughout the complaint and came to the conclusion that there was probable cause. I mean, literally, the district court you know, found probable cause. You know, you read cause. this record and you step back from this case and you say, the bus driver overreacted, got involved in something, that was a, a student's conversation with another student, that the school Joan, that the school system overreacted in pursuing criminal prosecution. Why didn't they just discipline her, counsel her, and warn her? And uh, uh, it, it seemed to me when the uh, uh, court threw it out uh, throughout the case, it was probably justified as a reaction by both parties. And uh, uh, you wonder now here, we're here on a collateral proceeding saying that uh, uh, who struck John? Uh, who, 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 whose overreaction was the worst? I mean, it's uh, 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 and the district court throws it out for qualified immunity, saying this is this is. We we uh, uh, and we certainly understand your honor's point. I mean, I'm, a, I'm just focusing on judgment calls here. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's exactly your honor. I, I think your point is very well taken, uh, in that that's exactly what qualified immunity is about. It's about those judgment calls and that as a government official and particularly a police officer, uh, you don't get called to the carpet every time you make a judgment call that maybe was not the perfect one under the circumstances. What we have here is we have a uh, police officer that was uh, handed over this situation and went to a magistrate judge, got a warrant. The short answer, Your Honor, in all of this is I, I do believe that what we're looking for, at least at this point, even on qualified immunity, we're not even looking at did he have probable cause. It's, a, it's, that, reasonably, it's that objective reasonableness standard. But the district court went forward. They looked at the video and said, based upon the circumstances, and I think Your Honor's right, we have a student that got onto a bus running her mouth to her friend 
think that the video shows that the student gets on saying, I will punch her in her face. The friend that she's talking to says, no, you won't. Student sits down, is very quiet in the seat. At that point, that's when Ms. Tweed unbuckles, gets out of her seat, goes over to the student, and that's when the confrontation says. Your Honor, I, I, I and, can and, answer and, your and, question. Uh, and uh, 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 you guys uh, thought that's criminal conduct and wanted to convict her of a crime. Well, Why wasn't she just disciplined? I, Your Honor, I think that they, I, I think ultimately, and I'll allow Ms. York to discuss that uh, since I'm the, the well, officer you Jones. The officer, the officer is, uh, uh, was well, the officer a school employee? The officer is a police department employee assigned to work at the school. So, Your Honor, I, I think that what, what you have is you've got a situation where uh, Ms. Tweet gets up and, Your Honor, when you ask the question, what does bring it on mean? I, I think Your Honor's interpretation is exactly the interpretation because she is asking her, who are you going to hit in the face? Who are you going to hit in the face? You talking about me? You're going to hit me in the face? Bring it on. I think that was exactly what it was. It was an invitation to fight. It was the mannerism of her leaning over. It was blocking that seat. And I think that as a, a police officer viewing that video, when you have an adult school official that is dealing with a minor child, the tendency is probably to protect the minor child in that circumstance. And I think that that's what they did. Uh, but, but, I think, but I think Judge Niemeyer, and I, his point, is, I think, is well taken in with regard to what, what's actually occurred here. You've got these bus drivers. There's obviously, there's a history between this student and the bus driver. These bus drivers have students of all types on there, some of them very unruly that get on the bus, and they have to deal with a lot of this stuff. She overreacted on this occasion. And then it goes to this Rhodes, and then Rhodes decides that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go ahead and take care of this little problem with a, with a hammer. And and that's and and then Rhodes overreacts, and then it gets to this. I think the court, I think uh, I think the district court did the right thing here. But but um, it, this is what happens when when the wrong people are running the show. Your Honor, I, I think that uh, looking back on this, that we could all sit here and say, how would we have handled the situation, and maybe we would have all handled it differently. Um, but I, I think, Your Honor, you are correct when you say that you think the district court did the right thing because the, the, when we're talking about these 1983 malicious prosecution and we're talking about qualified immunity, we're not here to second guess and say, would we have done it the same thing? We're here to say, did they, object, did they act reasonably under the circumstances? Did they have some sort of uh, probable cause? And I think in these circumstances, um, Judge Hudson very clearly found from looking at the video there was probable cause to believe that disorderly conduct occurred, and the fact that both he and the magistrate judge found it stops the causation. Let me ask this question. Did the district court say it was not going to reach an issue of clearly established law because there was no constitutional violation and yet still found qualified immunity? The, the, he did, because to get the qualified immunity, um, it's got to be both, that there was a constitutional violation, and if there was the violation, that, that's how you overcome the qualified immunity, that there's right. a constitutional violation that was clearly established. Since he found no constitutional violation, he didn't need to get to the <laughs> second point. But I think that um, Judge Hayton's question, uh, and I won't belabor that point because we raised it in our brief, but... We believe that Ms. Thweet, through her briefing, has absolutely admitted that, um, that there can't be that clearly established constitutional right when you turn around and you say, this is an open question that the courts have never decided. So I think if Judge Hudson had reached that issue, and, and we argued in our briefs below to the district court that it was not a clearly established constitutional right, I don't believe that uh, the district court needed to get that far under the analysis they did. The analysis was no constitutional violation. The warrant, uh, the warrant operates to break the causal chain, taking both of those. We don't have a claim here um, and properly dismiss this claim. Based on that, we would ask this court to affirm the district court's decision. We think it is the correct decision All and right. that uh, it's in accordance with law. Thank you, Mr. Sparks. Ms. York? May it please the court, Melissa York on behalf of Ronald Rhodes. Um, Your Honors, my client situated a little bit differently because he did not go to the magistrate to swear out the warrant. 
Um, the complaint only alleges three facts about my client, and that is that he met with Ms. Thweet on May the 10th, that he gave her the letter that's attached at it as Exhibit 1 to the complaint, which is at Joint Appendix 15, and that he informed her that she'd be placed on administrative leave without pay pending the court proceedings because Officer Jones was going to press charges. Then at paragraph 29 of the complaint, you get a conclusory allegation that Officer Jones, at the direction of Ron Rhodes, uh, proceeded to the magistrate to swear out a warrant. And there are no facts as to what uh, Mr. Rhodes told Officer Jones, whether he directed him uh, as to what to say to the magistrate, or even that they spoke at all. A conversation can be inferred from the complaint, but the facts of that conversation cannot. And plaintiff, in her opening brief at page 2, footnote 1, concedes that she has no facts to support that conclusory allegation that Rhodes directed Officer Jones to seek the warrant. And so for that reason, uh, Ron Rhodes could not have caused Ms. Sweet's arrest because you have the intervening, superseding uh, decision makers in Officer Jones and the magistrate. And for that reason, there is no constitutional violation alleged against my client, and he was entitled to qualified immunity. We also, Your Honors, um, agree that there was probable cause if you view the video, which Judge Hudson did. Um, he had all the evidence that Ms. Thweet argues should have been presented to the magistrate and made the conclusion that there was probable cause for the arrest. Qualified immunity um, protects uh, those who sometimes have to make bad guesses in gray areas, and while things could have been done differently, perhaps maybe discipline was appropriate instead of criminal charges, we're not here to second guess those decisions. We're here today to, de to determine whether there was... What do you understand to be the constitutional violation that's been alleged? My understanding is that Ms. Sweet is alleging a Fourth Amendment violation, an unreasonable seizure, based upon her arrest for disorderly conduct. And that requires um, that the defendant caused the seizure without probable cause and that the seizure terminated in her favor. Obviously, she was uh, acquitted in Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Court, so it, the proceedings did terminate in her favor. But because there was probable cause for the arrest and because my client did not cause the arrest, um, there is no constitutional violation alleged. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All right. Mr. Thorson. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, again, I want to point to the Virginia Code Section 22.1-279 Point one, to talk about whether or not this was disorderly conduct on the on the basis of uh, Mrs. Uh, Tweet, that statute covers school employees, and it says that uh, the use of incidental, minor, or reasonable physical contact, or their actions designed to maintain order and control, are to be given due deference to reasonable judgments at the time of the event when they were made, including teachers, principals, or other persons employed by the school. That's Tweet. It also covers actions designed to maintain order and control. That's, that's what Tweet was trying I, I to do. I guess I'm trying to understand how that relates to the constitutional violation. Like, that's, that's probably a good argument that your client was properly found not guilty of violating the statute. But it can't be that every time an officer arrests someone for something that is ultimately results in an acquittal, not only was that wrong, that was so wrong that it was a Fourth Amendment violation to arrest them in the first place. You're so, saying the magistrate got it wrong. The, the magistrate didn't apply the law correctly, right? But, didn't, but, that's, didn't, but, that's, but that's, the magistrate did look at everything, and if the magistrate swings we, and misses, we don't, uh, Your that's Honor, the magistrate swing and miss. Your Honor, we don't know what the magistrate looked at. There's, I have no evidence that the magistrate saw the video. The video was, it was even presented don't to Don't we him. presume that it... Uh, a warrant issued by a magistrate judge in the course of his order, uh, unless you have something else to point out, that it's uh, presumed that is a proper warrant? Well, in this case, Judge, if, 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 the, if the magistrate did look at the video, he shouldn't have issued the warrant. I know, but we don't review that. We don't review that. We're reviewing the persons who instigated that. And, your, and the question is, why doesn't the magistrate's warrant insulate their liability? The arrest was made pursuant to, or seizure was made pursuant to a warrant. That's based, what the Constitution authorizes. Yeah, based on the oral testimony of Jones. Oral testimony. So what? And the, and the warrant didn't even identify the student in the video. Do you know it was wrong? 
the oral testimony, he could have repeated exactly what the tape said, or he could have repeated exactly what's in the letter, or both. I, I don't know, Judge. We'd have to. We don't know, but we'd you, have to take you've the got the burden to prove that. Right. You've but got I, the burden to say that the, there was a warrant for the seizure. You've got to demonstrate that that violated the Constitution. But we've we've and made. You say a, I don't have any evidence. We've made a plausible case to get past the pleading stage, Judge. We've made that plausible case. What, the, what, and, I, I don't understand how you say the uh, the magistrate judge acted improperly. He acted on f false, misleading or incomplete information where is that? provided just, by Jones. Can I just reassert, where in the complaint does it allege that? The complaint alleges he did it at the instigation of someone. Where does it allege that the magistrate acted on inaccurate information or that someone left information out to the... Basically, Judge Niemeyer said earlier, like, basically a Frank's argument. Where is the argument in the complaint that says the magistrate judge was lied to or given false information or anything like that? I believe we made that uh, statement in the complaint. We, at paragraph 37, uh, Jones acted, uh, Rhodes and Jones acted recklessly and actual malice and with the conscious disregard for our rights in pursuing the criminal charges. That they, uh, the, we said that the bus film, as summarized in the letter on its face, was so lacking in indicia of probable cause to support the charge of disorderly conduct as to render official belief in existence by the magistrate judge unreasonable. And, uh, We believe we, we've argued that, Judge. All right. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Thank you very much for your uh, Thank you. Time. We'll adjourn court sine die, and we'll come down and recounsel.